But I do want to talk about the so-called medical marijuana. I usually say marijuana as medicine because medical marijuana doesn't connect with me. I don't see it as medicine. I used to be the head of the DEA. And the administrator of the DEA does what Andre Barthwell and Bob DuPont talked a little bit about, gets involved in the scheduling of drugs. They have to meet eight factors to get on a schedule. And they have to be approved by the FDA. Marijuana doesn't meet those criteria. But here's your first quiz to see if you've been able to understand what's been said this morning. How many chemicals are in a marijuana joint? Now you've got five options. 10 to 20, how many do you think is 10 to 20? 20 to 50, 50 to 100, Andrea said there are over 50 cannabinoids. How about 100 to 400? There are 468 chemicals in a marijuana joint. That is a lot of chemicals. Now here's your second question. You take a drink. We've got absolute vodka, but any alcoholic beverage and a marijuana joint the question is this, how much longer does a marijuana joint, will its chemicals and will its uh, ingredients stay in the body and in the brain compared to taking one drink of alcohol? The same amount of time, twice as long, 25 times as long, 50 times as long, or 75 times? If you said 75, that's the right answer. Because marijuana stays, as Andrea said, in the fatty tissues of the body. And that's in the brain. It's not in the butt. You've got muscle there. It's not in the stomach. You've got some fat tissue there. But the brain is laced with fat. It doesn't weigh very much. About three and a half pounds of brain. But it's laced with fatty tissues. And the ingredients from a marijuana joint set up a tent, and they camp out up there. They've got the de cooking devices. They've got, you know, a canopy. They've got a sleeping bag. They stay there a long time. And that's one of the problems with medical marijuana, and this bill particularly. I'll get to that in a sec. Here's an issue that I want to talk about today, and that's Accidents on the highways, accidents in the workplace. Both Andrea Barthwell and Bob DuPont, both doctors and physicians, have talked about studies from the Society for Addiction Medicine. Bob cited a study uh, in Maryland at a trauma center, I think in Baltimore. I want to talk about emergency room admissions at hospitals. Most of us, at one time or another, know someone who's been taken to an emergency room under dire circumstances. The police community certainly knows about it. They often are involved in that situation. But today, how many people will be going to an emergency room one day where the drug that is identified in their system as a result of that admission is marijuana? It's over a thousand. It's 1,250 people every day in the United States going to an emergency room and having marijuana identified as a substance. Now look at this chart behind me. And you can see the dramatic increase in the number of emergency room admissions. There's a chart at the back of the room. But in the last three years, in which we've got statistics from the National Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration, so-called Dawn Report, it's been a 25% increase in, treat, in hospital room admissions 
in emergency rooms with marijuana. Now, why is that? What has happened in the last few years? There's been a proliferation of medical marijuana reaching 100 million people in population. Not half the United States, 18 states in the district. But I, even I added up all of the population in those 18 states, and it's a third of the United States in population that has a medical, so-called medical marijuana access. And the emergency room incidents with marijuana reflect that, because that's been a dramatic shift in access. As Andrea said, the FDA has concluded that marijuana has a high potential for abuse, has no accepted medical use, and lacks even an acceptable level of safety under medical supervision. And yet there are legislators in Springfield this week that are going to vote on whether this should be available. They're going to put themselves in the role of the FDA. They're going to decide what's medicine. Even though the American Cancer Society recommends against and discourages medical marijuana state initiatives. Even though the American Society for Multiple Cirrhosis is against medical marijuana. And so is the Society for Glaucoma and Crohn's Disease. Now these are illnesses, diseases listed in the bill as qualifying under House Bill 1 for people to get medical marijuana from a physician. But the very organizations nationally that represent these patients say it's bad medicine. Now, the House Bill language in its 200 pages claims numerous therapeutic value documented by studies. However, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C., January 22nd this year, ruled against the petition to reschedule marijuana, saying no adequate and well-controlled studies exist on marijuana's medical efficacy. And this is the district court that's looking at hundreds, thousands of pages of documents arguments from the people that want to argue for making marijuana available as medicine. Is smoking a cigarette and smoking a marijuana joint the same in terms of highway safety? I'd like to hear a resounding no from this audience. No. And why not? Because marijuana has psychoactive ingredients that affect judgment, timing, coordination, depth perception. Here's what's happened in a state that has voted recently to try to legalize recreational use, but it's had <laughs> medical marijuana in place for over a decade. Look at the number of highway fatalities in which the driver causing the crash tested positive for marijuana. 130 deaths in the last three years. Tripled since they've started the medical marijuana provisions back in 2000. More than tripled. And, and this is not a study that I just happened to scribble myself. This came from the Department of Transportation in the state of Colorado. Think of someone driving on the highway who has just smoked a joint. 65 miles an hour on one of our tollways and you're heading in the opposite direction. This bill, House Bill 1, allows someone to drive immediately after smoking a joint. Let me repeat that. There is no time limit after smoking in this bill. 
and the number of crashes, motor vehicle crashes, that are linked to people that use marijuana are double those that don't. A detailed study, epidemiological reviews, documented this. This is what is in the bill. I want you to stay with me because I'm going to read it. Right now the language says a person sh shall not drive or be in control of a vehicle while there is in any amount of a drug in a person's breath, blood, or urine resulting from unlawful use of consumption of cannabis. However, House Bill 1 says this paragraph does not apply to the lawful consumption of cannabis by a qualified patient under the compassionate use of medical cannabis, unless that person is impaired. But here's the trick. How is the impairment defined? They don't allow you to use a chemical drug test, a blood test, to define impairment. Instead, they have to have a standard impairment test, which is a very specialized evaluation. There are only 24 evaluators today in the state of Illinois that can carry this test out. And it's not been used as a method of measurement in the workplace by employers. The employers in Illinois, and many of you before you were hired probably, took a drug test. And if you passed and you didn't have marijuana in your system, you got hired. That's another reason I think, Bob, we had that 40% decrease from 1979 to 1990. The parent movement, major factor, but employer drug testing in the workplace, reaching 100 million people with jobs, was another reason that drove down drug use. And now we're going to take the drug test out of a measurement for when a person may be impaired. They're caught on the highway, they can't use a drug, urine, or blood test. They have to have a standard of impairment test, which is a 12-step process. There's a copy at the back of the rooms that the Illinois Sheriff's Association has provided to the legislature detailing the problems with that test. Highway safety. The Department of Transportation for the U.S. put out regulations in 1988 dealing with people who were in safety-sensitive positions. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission has done this. So has the Department of Energy. So that bus drivers today, truck drivers on the highways driving 18-wheelers, people driving school buses, people that are on airplanes, in ships, in locomotives, in passenger trains, in buses, all are subject to these rules. And those rules say you cannot come to work or work with an illegal substance in your system, with marijuana in your system, a detectable amount of it, or you'll be taken off that assignment. And depending on the employer, you may lose your job, you may be suspended, you may get to treatment, which we'd recommend, come back, be tested again, and these individuals are tested at random. The Department of Transportation rules were put in place for a reason. Marijuana users have twice the number of motor vehicle accidents, but there is no time limit placed on someone in this bill who smokes a joint at home. They can go out within three minutes, get on a car or a motorcycle, get on the highway, go into your town and drive. And people that are using medical marijuana, people that are using marijuana, that material, the psychoactive ingredients, stay in the system. Not just for two or three minutes, but for days. And they're not safe to drive. I wouldn't drive, why would you get on 
a, a, a bus or a plane if the pilot had just smoked pot. If they had that pilot would be arrested and sent probably to jail. Might lose his job for sure. But Illinois, our 12 million people are going to be exposed to drivers who've smoked marijuana minutes before they get back in an automobile. Not safe. And the bill allows any 18-year-old to obtain a medical marijuana card without parental permission. Drunk driving with too much alcohol is illegal. And there are blood tests and alcohol breath tests that discourage driving while drinking. There is no such test in prohibition for medical marijuana users. I don't know what the legislature is thinking. Can employers maintain a safe workplace? When an employee comes to work after smoking a joint the night before, most employers that require a drug-free workplace will say two things. Don't come to work under the influence of alcohol or illegal drugs, drugs that could impair your performance. This bill allows a user of marijuana with a medical marijuana card to come to work, and they don't allow that person necessarily to be required to take a drug test. They have to demonstrate impairment before a test is imposed. Illinois employers are responsible. Marine Valley is responsible for a safe work environment. That's the responsibility of the college. One way to do it is to make sure people coming to work here are free from the effects of alcohol and drugs. The impact in the workplace of this bill will be serious. The impacts of this bill in public safety on the highways will be serious and probably deadly. Because people, as Bob DuPont suggested, there's no bottom in some of this marijuana use. They take a joint and they think they're fine. I'm not saying this because I've done this myself. I'm saying this because we've seen studies with pilots that I'll show you a little later that thought they were fine. This is a photo of a crash that took place in Chase, Maryland about 25 years ago of a Conrail engineer by the name of Ricky Gates and his brakeman, who'd smoked marijuana that day, drove their Conrail locomotive out of the yard and crashed into a Metro liner coming from New York to Washington. Killed a lot of people. Injured over 200. And the Department of Transportation put in rules to prohibit people in safety-sensitive jobs from having any marijuana in their system when they were at work. Business owners will have lower productivity and increased expenses as a result of accidents, absenteeism, and damages caused by people using marijuana. When I first got into the field of consulting on drugs in the workplace, one of our clients was the US Postal Service. Their Boston office did a study before they decided to do drug testing of 4,000 applicants. And they measured up how did these individuals do in the workplace compared to those that weren't positive for marijuana and cocaine.
Those were the two principal drugs they looked at. And it was dramatic that those that tested positive, they still were hired by the Postal Service. They hadn't adopted this rule yet. It was the early 1980s. But they wanted to see, because they're one of the largest employers we have in the United States. Hundreds of thousands of employees would have to be drug tested, and their applicants. So before embarking on that, they wanted to see, does it make a difference? It does. The absenteeism rate for those that tested positive for marijuana was up over 30%. The accident rate was over 40%. And they had disciplinary problems that outnumbered those that didn't show positive substantially. So the Postal Service decided nationwide we're going to do drug testing. To get a job at the Postal Service, you have to pass a drug test. It has a direct impact on short-term memory, as Andrea said, on depth perception, on attention span, acuity, and judgment. If this bill passed, there'd be two standards. The standards for people that don't have a marijuana card and the standards for people that do. And people that would be coming to work with marijuana in their system put their workplace at risk, their co-workers at risk, their employers at risk. Is the state of Illinois going to pay for the increased costs, for the accidents, for the absenteeism, for a third party claim of someone that's injured? Say an Illinois employer has a medical marijuana card user who comes to work right after smoking a joint. They have a company car. They drive and they have an accident. Hurt someone, kill someone. Who's going to pay for this? I understand that people have pain, have cancer, have glaucoma, have multiple cirrhosis. There are products that Andrea Barthwell, Dr. Barthwell has identified that can deal with these conditions. Marinol is synthetic, as Bob DuPont talked, is available. Zofran, another pill, is available to deal with some of the effects of both chemotherapy and pain. And they're FDA approved. The marijuana available in this bill ain't at a drugstore. It's not going to be in a prescription. You're not going to know Take it three times a day, 20 milligrams. There are not going to be instructions as to how often you use it, where it was grown, what the side effects are, what's going to happen to your body. And this bill doesn't hold employers harmless for the effects of issuing a medical marijuana card for someone going to work. So the costs are going to go up. There are going to be four state agencies that are going to have to hire employees to process all the paperwork. Let me tell you about one study. It was done by Dr. Jerome Savage at Stanford University. They found 12 pilots who were smokers, so they knew how to inhale. They said, we'd like you to come to a link trainer, kind of a simulator, where the pilot gets in kind of a little cockpit, got all the same operating tools that they would have if they were in a Cessna aircraft. And they said to the pilot, land on the center of the runway. And they did. They landed on the average 12 feet from the center of the runway. Probably from me, closer to the end of that table. For those of you that watch the Masters golf tournament, it's about the size, it's about the length of the putt that uh, Adam Scott made to win the championship. It's a fair distance, but it's relatively close. From me to the first row, they gave each of the pilots a marijuana joint. This was 3% THC. That's about a third or a fourth of today's 
powerful THC. 3% delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol. So it was a weak joint. They smoked it, and one hour later, they went back, got in the link trainer, and were asked to land on the center of the runway. They missed it on an average by 32 feet. They were then said to relax, read a book, TV. Four hours later, go back, see how you do. They missed the center of the runway by 29 feet. The N were asked to sign us a representation. They wouldn't have a drink of alcohol, no medications, no pills, come back exactly 24 hours later. And they missed the center of the runway by 24 feet. This is a day later from one joint. One pilot missed the runway completely. It was off on a hill somewhere a day later. And this is, this is an actual study documented by Dr. Savage from Stanford on the effect one day later of one joint. This bill does not require a photo ID. I'm going to demonstrate what I'm talking about. This is a picture of me and a driver's license. Now, when I go somewhere that wants to make sure who I am, they look to see if they see a gray-haired guy with glasses that may not look too alert, and is that Bensinger? This bill is going to have a name of a marijuana card holder but it's going to have no photo ID. How many times do you think that'll be used not by the person to which that card was issued? No photo ID. I'm done. My slides are over. But I want to, I want to provoke a couple of thoughts really with you. The idea of marijuana as medicine, for me, rests with the FDA. The idea of marijuana being passed by the Illinois legislature is a contradiction in terms. They're not the medical experts. And they're putting themselves in the place of the medical experts. And they're putting the youth of our state, I'm talking about our kids, at jeopardy. Because the minute, the minute that bill and the governor signs it, and they set up this system, there will be more marijuana. Make no question about it. In Colorado, a state with five million people, they have over 110,000 marijuana cards, 2% of the population. <laughs> Michigan has 135,000. California, maybe three quarters of a million. And once this act is in place, each of the individual patients gets two and a half ounces of marijuana. Now this is more important than any slides I've shown you. That's 183 joints in two weeks. Now what medical marijuana patient is gonna smoke one joint an hour? because that would be what would be required if they were to consume all that supply. Two and a half ounces every 14 days, 183 joints. Most patients may smoke one every two or three, four or five hours, four a day. So they're gonna have eight or nine a day excess times 14 days. Where is that marijuana gonna go? They're going to give it to friends or sell it. No question about it. And it's going to be used by the youngest people. If you look at who's using marijuana today, it's 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. People under 21 are the biggest consumers of marijuana. And this bill passes, there are going to be Many, 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 many more thousands of marijuana joints available every day in this state. Maybe there's 100,000 marijuana card holders. 
maybe 200,000. They're going to have marijuana that's going to go beyond their own personal possession. They're also going to have marijuana that can put other people at risk if they're driving a motor vehicle. They're also going to have people and their employer at risk if they go to work with marijuana in their system. And they're going to put you and I and our kids and our grandchildren at risk because more availability means more use, means more abuse, means more addiction, and means a really a less productive society impacting on our health and safety. How many of you know the name of your House representative? Please raise your hands. I would like someone in the audience to ask me, what do you want me to do? Do, do I have a volunteer? What do you want us to do? I want you to get on the phone, get your email working, write a letter, show up at the district office of the representative in your district and say vote no on House Bill 1. 